Welcome to Cinema Galactica. We are self-isolating so efficiently that we're in different counties at the moment. Yes. Mm. Different counties from anyone. No. Yeah. Different, different counties merely from each other. That's not that different a, a situation, is it, Graham? Not really, no. In many ways, that was the joke. Yes. Yes. But yeah, we are Cinema Galactica. I'm Graham, I'm Graham and this week I've been joined by... Tim. Hello. And nobody and else. We are, and nobody else at the moment. In the second half of the show, uh, we're going to have some other people in. We're going to have Mick reviewing the 60s gangster film Villain. We're going to have Aiden reviewing Hibakatsu Koryeda's new The Truth. And we're going to have Mark, who is up to the Timothy Dalton years in his, we now realise, a bit premature Bond retrospective. Yes. It's a bit of a sort of Frankenstein show in that respect, isn't it? Everyone's... um. Mm. Section is being hacked together separately into one uh, one scientist, no, one monster. Yes, that's you it. And I, <laughs> you and I are going to be reviewing our film of the week. Yes, uh, which we had a director's lottery a bit back, but we didn't get around to doing this. Uh, but we are this week doing Il Divo by the Oscar winning Paolo Sorrentino. Uh, but before that, we had Question of the Week, which I, I would say shamelessly exploit the current COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fair. Um, because obviously it's been a time of great disruption at the cinema. The cinema's closed all over Britain at the moment. Uh, but we have enough ideas to keep Cinema Eclectica going in the absence of that. Uh, it also gives the idea for our new question of the week, which is... Which upcoming movie should be delayed for as long as possible? Uh, on Facebook, Mikey Toes says, Anything, literally anything, by the Asylum Studio. We have already had to end you a battle Star Wars, their rip-off of the Star Wars series, with the coveted score of 1.6 on IMDb. <laughs> Is that, well, that's 1.6 out of 10, not out of 100, isn't it, though? It's yeah, I suppose. And, so. It seems to me that with those with those asylum knockoffs, they've gone so far through them actually being rubbish, they've almost come out the other side. You know, it's uh, well, maybe. Yeah. I have yet to pluck up the courage to watch one to test whether that theory is true or not. Uh, Damon Skinner picks up on one that has indeed uh, been delayed. Uh, says too many to list. Pointless sequels like A Quiet Place 2, for starters. Yeah, it's a funny one, that, isn't it? I mean, why are they... Mm. It, it's just kind of, like, hard to imagine. I mean, I find something slightly obnoxious in this naming convention where things are called Part 2. I think it's called A Quiet Place Part 2, isn't it? it yeah, I think it is, actually. Yeah, yeah, like, it's the second chapter. What happened at the end of the Quiet yeah. Place 1? Did they actually get out from under it at all? I'm not sure they did, really. Um, spoilers if you haven't watched Quiet Place, listeners, but yes, I think that John Krasinski dies, the family get away, the alien invasion still very much in place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on Twitter, we have a couple of our co-hosts chiming in. Rob Simpson says, probably controversial, but Denis Villeneuve's June. Yes, he is a fancy McFancy Pants director, but given how Blade Runner 2049 turned out, how increasingly pretentious his movies are becoming, and the history of June adaptations, the more time between me and this movie, the better. Yeah. I mean, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because it's kind of... It, which way could it possibly go with... June, it could. It's probably going to have to go to a kind of very bleak sort of, I don't know, slightly kind of colourless attempted high sci-fi thing rather than a sort of fantasy thing. And mm, that's fair. I don't point. know. I'm still curious to see it. To tell you the truth, it's got a lovely cast, but that's that's how they get you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, is it is it the case that we know from historical experience that merely delaying June? for a long time is not necessarily going to increase its quality. <laughs> you know, it's one of the few where we've got an actual, you know, uh, body of data to draw on in that respect. Yeah, I suppose so, yes. 
Yeah. I'm hoping, obviously, that uh, he's decided just to adapt Hodorowsky's 12-hour script, which yeah. I know many people consider to be the only true version of June. It's not even just a script, is it? It's a sort of mad giant photo album <laughs> with lots of drawings yes. in it and that kind of thing, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, I, I love Hodorowsky, but it's completely unmakeable in a hilarious way. Yeah. Uh, and finally, Aidan Fatkin says, Morbius. I have no other answer, just Morbius, and not because I'm not a fan of comic book movies. I just won't tolerate Jared Leto. Why is Jared Harris in this? He was amazing in Chernobyl. Who blackmailed him? What is Morbius? It's... I don't even know what Morbius is. You know how Sony have been doing this weird thing where they try and make a series of Spider-Man movies with as little Spider-Man in as they can legally manage? Oh, like the Venom movie? Yeah. They're, they're doing yes. one for the one that our sister podcast for panel lovingly refers to as Morbius the Euro trashy vampire. Oh, I remember Morbius. I remember him being quite a good Spider-Man villain, actually. He's like a giant bat as well. He's not just a vampire. He's actually a mm. huge bat. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how the hell he's going to carry his own movie, though. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's well. quite a wild concept for comic books, isn't he? So he's a bat, but also a man. Where, where did they get their ideas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're really yes. thinking outside the box. <laughs> Uh, my answer would be, and not just because it's going to reignite the 2010s most tiresome culture war, but, you know, that would help, um, is Ghostbusters Afterlife. Who is, who's behind Ghostbusters Afterlife? Who's it got in it? Who's on board it? Uh, it's got the original Ghostbusters and Paul Rudd and some kid from Stranger Things. Okay, yeah, that... Yeah, I don't need to see that, really. Can't they just wait until we're... Um, <laughs> Dead? Until we're, uh, yeah, exactly. Long in our graves. <laughs> I think that's just kind of one to be buried in some sort of... Um, you know, some sort of uh, underground nuclear repository. Mm. I think what, what particularly bothers me about this to expand is that it seems to be kind of reclaiming the Ghostbusters series as this kind of Spielbergian rural American schmaltz with kids in it, which obviously has absolutely nothing to do with the original two films whatsoever. And it just, I, I don't know, it reminds me, nostalgia is not a great thing, but at least back in the 80s when people were nostalgic for the 50s, they did things like Back to the Future, which expressed that nostalgia in a vaguely original way. But now, because everything's franchised, we have to take old franchises from the 80s and mangle them until they fit our vision of what the 80s must be like, which is basically like Stranger Things. And I just but find that bizarre and awful. It's just had a weirdly kind of sort of sentimental kind of trailer, didn't it? And I, I yeah. don't know what style it was supposed to be or why anyone thought that was like Ghostbusters. But anyway, yeah. I think the other thing is that it's directed by Jason Reitman, whose qualifications in terms of being the son of the original director are impeccable. He's definitely got that down pass. But <laughs> yeah. the best you can hope for from a Jason Reitman movie is sitting down at the end and thinking, hmm, that wasn't a waste of time. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, yes. That's his pinnacle. Yeah, oh dear. Okay. It also seems like they're kind of doubling back a bit from the previous Ghostbusters mm. movie that at least was just kind of like an honest, let's just make a new, a new Ghostbusters movie that was pretty kind of unoriginal in a way. Yeah, but, but just had a new of... cast of new Ghostbusters in it. And crucially, if you don't like it because it's not in continuity, you can just ignore it. Although yeah. everyone who didn't like it has spent the last four years grizzling about it still, so that didn't work. <laughs> also, um, if you've no idea what a Ghostbuster is because you were born afterwards the first time, you can watch this and it will explain and introduce a Ghostbuster and then give you an adventure with some Ghostbusters happening. Yeah. You'd think that would be quite high on the priorities list for a Ghostbusters movie. Yeah, but apparently movie. not. Apparently not, no. Did we actually grouse about the uh, 
uh, No Time to Die and the, the possible uh, explanations with James Bond that they haven't actually made the film? Uh, no, I, I haven't. Was that the this. suggestion? No, I've, I've, I've merely heard that as an, a, an explanation with a very, very little plausibility to it that, in fact, there's... Um, you know, the, the studio had not finished making the film and it's merely using the coronavirus <laughs> as an excuse. I mean, or indeed not even started making the film. But that's obviously cobblers because there's a trailer. Well, yeah, I suppose. Conceivably, they could have made the trailer first and then be making the film to match it. I mean, that's a kind of... That's a, a tried and tested technique from the old days, wasn't it? Produce the trailer first. See well, what people react to. Yeah, in terms of, like, very low-budget films that could be knocked out in a weekend... They didn't do it. For I'm not ben saying Hur. I seriously believe this theory. It's the maddest thing I've ever heard. I'm glad. It's what was the backup plan if there wasn't like a worldwide pandemic in the month of release? Was the head of MGM just going to stand up in at the premiere in front of everyone? And go. So yeah, bit of an awkward situation here. Yeah. Yeah. The um. The, uh, no, I think there's other excuses you could find, though, couldn't you? I mean, you could say, you, you point to any horrifying act of uh, violence or war or terrorism anywhere in the world and say, no, it was a bit too similar to that, so it's a <laughs> to delay the... Uh, the only trouble with that approach would be that that would obviously have logically delayed every James Bond film since the yes. series began. The, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm the- still hoping that it's going to be called Time to Die when it finally comes out. <laughs> They could have delayed Octopussy because John Wayne Gacy used to dress up as a clown as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's as good as an, uh, <laughs> that's as as good an answer as I got. I'm quite happy for the James Bond to be delayed, and indeed it is. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, from that rampant cynicism onto the carefree, optimistic idealistic world of politics. Uh, we are reviewing Il Divo by Pablo Sorrentino. It's a biopic of the former Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti, who it would be fair to say I know nothing about. Yeah, I didn't know terribly much. I mean, to tell you the truth, it's it's obviously we've got to get... This is the elephant in the room, really, of saying, yes, uh, two British film reviewers now talk about <laughs> Italian politics they know nothing whatever about. And, in fact, it was when this movie first came out. I mean, it came out, what, about 10 years ago, a bit less than that? Mm, uh, just a bit over 10 years ago, yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. Uh, and got critical acclaim at the time. Mm. But, on the other hand, it was particularly pointed out that, well, Italian audiences are probably going to like it because they're going to have some idea of who the people in it actually are. And if you're not an Italian... Are you going to actually get any of it? I don't Which know. is why I assume it opens with this very long, and it has to be said, quite entertaining glossary of Italian political terminology and scandals. Yeah, some anyway. It's um. So uh, Andreotti was pr- uh, president of Italy. I think I've got this right. Eighty-five times. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, wasn't it? It was in yes. the, it was in the the low eighties the number of times he was president of Italy across a period of a, something like one hundred and fifty years. And, um, <laughs> but uh, and this is uh, starring. Oh come on, Graham! What's the name? Tony Savillo. Tony Savillo, yes, yeah, certainly Savillo as Andreotti, and. Starting with him, obviously, in kind of old age, and they'd kind of done him up in in makeup to make him look more like Andreotti. I was wondering about this. Mm. Have, you, whether... have, have you seen a photo of Andreotti? Does it work? Because it, uh, I must admit, I didn't do my due diligence on this point and thought he just. Oh yes, I've it. seen photos of Andreotti, and it's kind of. Well, in a way, it works, which it makes it look like him. And I wonder if it's just the case that the audiences who were very familiar with his appearance wouldn't have kind of tolerated if he looked completely different, if you see what I mean. Yeah, quite possibly. Maybe it's something where you'd kind of expect him. I mean, it, it kind of vaguely reminded me, you know, there was a few cases where this reminded me sort of of Nixon, and by portrayals of Nixon. Mm. And in a similar way, there's like... You know, there's, there was a biopic of Nixon with uh, Anthony Hopkins as Richard Nixon. Yeah, the Oliver Stone well, he didn't film really, Nixon. Didn't, yeah, yeah, didn't really look terribly much like him, to be honest. I don't think they made an especially much effort. I mean, they kind of got away with it some of the time, but on the other hand, it was kind of like, well, did it, does it really matter that much what Nixon actually looks like? Is it going to spoil any 
scenes, especially in the film. I think they could have got away. They got away without it, and probably Andriotti could have got away without it as well, especially since it's the case. I mean, of- it's it, it's quite weird, isn't it, doing it with politicians? Because it's not as if Andriotti or indeed Richard Nixon were Rudolph Valentino. They weren't famous yeah. because of what they looked like. Yeah, but it's uh, it's also that it was done with pretty high quality makeup. Mm. Which they they actually got some did they get a, an Oscar for or at least a nomination for or something? It was yeah nominated yeah. Uh, for the Oscar for best makeup yes. Anyway, to uh, any of our listeners who were as unfamiliar with Andriotti as, uh, as I me. was before starting, <laughs> yeah, um, he was he was president of Italy numerous times and it was well it, you know is still considered scandalous and controversial for his ties to the mafia mm. and for various. Uh, dodgy uh, criminal events that he was supposedly linked to, he was put on trial for some complicity that way, but was acquitted. Yeah. And that was one of those kind of trial of the century sort of things. Um, and so he probably still divides opinion a lot. And there's also there's also a second Italian prime minister who features in Seville's film, which is Aldo Moro, who was prime minister of Italy very briefly before being kidnapped by the Red Brigades, a terrorist organisation, and killed. And he appears in these things where it's not quite clear whether they're flashbacks or projections from Andriotti's mind, where he's recording diaries and letters to send to the press which implicate Andriotti or point the finger at him for allowing this to happen. And it's quite strange. He's sort of like the ghost at the banquet there. Yeah, it's funny that. I mean, in a way, it's almost the, that aspect of it. I thought they could have included in the story more, but mm. the, the movie opens with effectively a kind of montage of, of pretty brutal kind of mafia murders, doesn't it? Hits yeah. carried out on people, you know, with guns or cars driven off bridges and that kind of thing, people being killed with machine guns. And it's kind of like, well, a, a lot of the story then following, including a lot of flashback, kind of mm. details the context of those murders and how Andriotti may or may not have been involved in them. And uh, Yeah. And it, it, it partly... I mean, part of the point of the movie, what it portrays about Andriotti is how kind of inscrutable and, and impenetrable a character he is, which is that he he's kind of difficult to get a handle on what he's thinking or why he's acting the way he is. And it's sort of like, well, did he really get involved in ordering like seven killings on people by mafia assassins and... Whether or not the movie doesn't kind of completely establish all of that, does it? It doesn't just sit yeah. down with the kind of forensic details because that's not the point of it. And I think but, it's uh, interesting how they do that is that uh, rather than say, you know, Andrietti did or did not order this assassination, possibly because there may still be legal problems about saying what exactly he did or didn't do, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it essentially uses intercutting for this. There is one scene which is. I think maybe the closest it gets to that kind of Oliver Stone Nixon territory where Andrietti is watching a horse race and he's like standing from the sidelines egging his horse on and into cook yeah. with this is a mafia hit so it looks briefly like he's like trying to encourage the assassin to do the job. Yeah. That was one of the kind of uh, the sort of montages, the stylish one that I thought worked reasonably well. But to tell you the yeah. truth, I kind of wish they'd done a bit more like that. I mean, it has um, it has. Uh, to be honest, you know, watching it as a, a British viewer, it does perhaps, you know, l- leave you in some cases thinking, well, did I need to know more about the internal workings of Italian politics for this? And it, the effect that seemed to have overall was sort of that there were a lot of secondary characters where maybe I thought I'm supposed to know who this is, and I don't really. I've just sort of vaguely heard the name, you know. Mm. But I'm sure if I was an Italian viewer, I'd have a much more kind of knowledge and probably more of an opinion. But on the other hand, as a movie, it doesn't spend a lot of time on kind of secondary characters, really. Mm-hmm. It, it has them there as a sort of circle around Andriotti himself. And actually, it it worked rather well that the, the sort of chorus of like cabinet members and Andriotti's inner circle mm-hmm. became this kind of weird sort of set of kind of secondary figures who are always kind of bickering and, and dancing about with each other and sort of yeah. walking around in the lobby of the rooms Andriotti is in. and it Yeah, I quite, liked that Quite clearly, too. yeah. It, uh, yeah. it introduces them through this kind of satirical cartoon montage where you see a string of people from Andriotti's cabinet 
uh, getting out of limousines and going through to meet him, and they're introduced with on-screen texts, including their nicknames, which are sometimes deeply bizarre. Isn't there one called the Lemon or something? Which yeah, there's one called the Lemon. There's one called the Shark. There's really not much of a, a, a pattern, particularly. Yeah, <laughs> there's that lovely, terribly mean close-up of like one incredibly fast MP getting out of the car, and then there's a big close-up of the car suspension resetting itself to normal never quite gets to the the level of being an actual kind of comedy satire like the thick of it or something or in the loop rather no no it's it's not like that but it has that as a kind of flavoring around the edges i think yeah the thing is mm. and this is kind of the possibly the the, the bombshell i'm going to drop here is that overall i didn't actually like the movie all that much i don't know mm. how would you how would you sum up your opinion overall do you think it was good well, I'm a big fan of Sorrentino's work, but the the criticism he gets over and over again is that he's style over substance, which is something which I, I don't yeah. personally agree with, but I see where it comes from. Il Divo, like a lot of his movies, has a lot of high society parties with people wearing expensive costumes, a lot of fancy loop de looping camera work, a lot of violent montages set to ironic pop songs. It's that sort of film, and it, it's the sort of thing which I think... I mean, some people flat out don't like it, and I think even some people who do like it might find it a bit hard to take when it's coupled with this non-stop flow of information about Italian political scandals we don't necessarily know anything about. Yeah. On the, on the other hand, I thought a lot of the cases, the stuff that he was doing that was kind of visual mm. oddity, like I say, like the, the characters sort of skidding along marble floors in, in palaces and stuff like that. and The odd-eyed cat. Yeah, and the uh, the party where everyone was dancing along to, uh, you know, kind of extremely loud music in the background. It's the sort of thing where it's like, yeah, it's slightly above uh, realistic in some ways, and obviously mm. maybe slightly contrived. But on the other hand, it still felt like the kind of thing where most of the time there was the kind of psychological element of it, suggesting it as a, a metaphor of some kind, it worked pretty well in a way. You know? mm. Yeah, I would agree. Well, some, some parts did. Mm. It's just a shame I kind of felt that uh, there wasn't if anything, kind of more of a story or more of an interesting story to tell using that. I mean, you know, some of the techniques were put to good use, but mm. there were other things like, you know, I'd kind of agree with that criticism of style over substance, at least in some in some cases. Like the thing with the kind of floating captions, you know, where the captions appear on the screen as like an object in the scene, so the camera pans yeah. around and the, the caption is there sort of floating in midair which really irritates me, to tell you the truth. I just <laughs> find that so pointlessly gimmicky. Yeah. Mm. But the other thing about it was funny was the amount of information that was dumped using captions like that. Although, in some cases, I like the fact it gives the guys absurd nicknames. Yeah. Like you said, there was a long kind of text intro at the start, which yeah. was kind of, like you say, entertaining in a way, but on the other hand, just dumped an absolutely massive pile of information before the film's action had started. And most of it was stuff that ended up being told by the film anyway. I mean, oh, yeah, I suppose, yeah. I don't know, yeah, it's... I think uh, I'd seen it before when it came out at the cinema, and one thing that I noticed on rewatch was that everything I remembered from it was something that happened within the first half of the movie. In the second half, it becomes very, very murky, which I think is, is partly intentional, this sense that what is being dug up is an almost incomprehensible mass of corruption. But I do understand yeah. how that can be heavy going. Yeah, and it, it did kind of get... It, it got sort of even more inscrutable what people's motives were and indeed what was happening in some individual scenes towards the second half. Mm. I mean, it's... Um, but I just... Um, I don't know. I I found overall. I mean, Sorrentino wrote the script here as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I found it to be what I thought was quite an quite an annoying script in some ways. I mean, it it spent a lot of time kind of given that, like I say, not knowing that much about Italian politics from like the nineteen from you know from before I was born. Yes. It's, um, it's the sort of thing where how the the movie provides a flow of information is going to make quite a big difference to how I. Uh, 
kind of enjoy the film in a way and it felt like it was constantly kind of telling rather than showing or find a contrived ways to you know people were playing back tape recordings that would have important stuff which sounded like somebody's in a monologue on them and there'd be there'd be kind of like phone calls where someone would ring up and must have been asking a load of questions that were just prompting Andriotti to say things that the viewer needed to know if you see what I mean yeah kind of although the, the tape recordings uh, the moral ones which keep coming up are real moral really did record a string of like uh-huh. taped confessions during his kidnap and I suppose for an Italian viewer they would know that so that was a fairly famous aspect of the case yeah there was a film about the moral kidnapping like on its own, called Good Morning Night by, was it Mario Bellocci that came out about sort of five years before this? All right. So it might have yeah, put which... it back in people's mind, I don't know. Yeah, although it might kind of explain how it, it's not that closely dwelled on in Il Divo, yeah. possibly because yeah. they knew that they'd, you know the same grounds had been covered earlier and didn't just want to repeat them. The, um... But on the mm. other hand, there's kind of stuff where a lot of the kind of questions about Andriotti's life and the kind of case and all the things he got up to, mm. they seem to weirdly, you know, they get kind of gone over in the, the text intro at the start, you know, the captions. And then there's also a scene about halfway through where he sits down with like a like a publisher who then gives a yes. big, long kind of monologue explaining the same things again, just mm. talking to Andriotti. Yeah, it works in a, in a way, it kind of works in the middle as a character moment for those two, except it's not terribly yeah. relevant, really, and it was just amazing the amount of kind of dialogue that was given over to it, really. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I do always enjoy about Sontino's films is his use of music, and this has some particularly peculiar choices. It manages somehow to use Camille Sanson's Dance Macabre in a way that makes it sound fresh and not tremendously overplayed. I enjoyed that. Uh, there's also a very strange use of Trio's novelty German pop hit Da 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 over the end <laughs> credits, which yeah. is a decision. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'll give you those. I don't think you can you can fault the music. I think most of the music worked pretty well. The um, the the other thing about it was funny was I kind of expected. Uh, there's plenty of scenes in it where I was sort of I don't know when that takes place, and there's bits that are flashbacks and flash forwards in some cases. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, there were a lot of scenes where it didn't feel like it mattered that much overall. You know the yeah. But then I kind of thought when kind of hearing about this initially, this movie, and hearing about the, the amount of makeup and stuff that's been done, I sort of assumed, well, this actor playing Andriotti, you know, whoever it was playing Andriotti, it turned out to Tony Savio, had, would have been made up to be different kind of ages of, of Andriotti, you know, we'd make younger uh, and yes. older, and we'd be yeah. flashing back and forth in his life, which is not really the case. Like I say, they seem to have just kind of made him up in order to look more like the real yeah. Andriotti, which, while it sort of worked to make him look like him, there were some other bizarre features. I mean, maybe the kind of... It, yeah, Italian audience just takes him for granted so much because he does have very big ears, doesn't he? <laughs> he, does. he has moderately he has moderately big ears in real life and in the made up, you know, the, the makeup covered version for this movie, he has ears that pretty much make him look like a kind of Star Wars alien, like he a has, rejected. <laughs> he has a, a, a mold of ear that I would class as the droopy Nosferatu. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, the Ferengi ambassador here, <laughs> so I might call it. Uh, yeah, well, so he it's very, wins. very unfair. I'm making fun of the fictionalised Andriotti, not the real Andriotti. He, he seems yeah. to have learned his lesson, though, because Sevillo recently played Berlusconi in uh, Sevillo's last movie, Laurel, for which he had a gruelling makeup regime involving slicking his hair back and wearing a sort of padded shirt. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, the other thing about it was, um, I think I'm right in saying Andri- Andriotti in real life has a, a like a, a slight kind of limp or something. He's got like some okay. back problem or something like that. Right. So he he kind of keeps yeah he keeps kind of quite still and he he turns around in a certain way. Maybe these are kind of very, again very well recognised characteristics. And the result of this really was just that Tony Savio sits in the middle of this movie, kind of keeping still most of the time, sitting down on chairs and benches, you know. 
holding his hands, his, his fingers in, in front of himself and just kind of fiddling mm. with his ring or whatever. Yeah. And doesn't really do anything much and doesn't express anything terribly much. And most of the time it's just silent and inscrutable. And I kind of thought, well, that was sort of the point of it, really. But it didn't really do anything much for me in the end. Yeah. There's a point where he, there's a point where he kind of breaks his silence and gives a very sort of angry rant justifying himself, doesn't he? Yeah, I was um, going to talk about that, which is um, he, he's on his own when he does that, so there's an implication that it might be an internal monologue, but Seville yeah. plays it as though he's talking, yes. Yeah, and it's um, it's actually a pretty good performance in that respect, but yeah. it doesn't ha- that doesn't happen very much in the movie at all, and I, I kind of still kind of sort of came out thinking it was quite, you know, heavy-handed. He He justifies himself basically by saying you know oh these people don't understand i had to do evil in order to do good which i didn't mm. find i don't know if we were supposed to find that argument terribly convincing certainly i didn't in that context but it's uh well it's not quite clear what the good he's trying to do is which i think is again yeah. part of the point he's accepted this near infinite level of moral compromises and shortcuts but in terms of having an actual vision for Italy or what its politics should be, there's nothing in evidence here. Yeah, but on the other hand, the movie is kind of too focused on the inside of the uh, mm. the sort of corridors of power, really, isn't it? I mean, it, yeah, that it's what does it actually show you? And I kind of felt like I needed something more like an access character. It might have been better for them to pin it down to more of a specific time and place. I mean, it, you could do the obvious kind of cliche of having a, a you know a journalist the, assigned to report on him or something but yeah or the secretary or something like that yeah yeah someone who gets a kind of assigned to him in some way but that wasn't really in there it yeah maybe i only need that because i'm such an ignoramus about italian politics i don't know yeah <laughs> it's like i mean I, I don't think anyone would blame you for being lost like say it's foreign country it's before we were born it has loads of references to very abstruse political scandals like the suicide or was it of Roberto Calvi? Yeah. (laughs) Yes, all right. I mean, in a sense, I I don't feel guilty about that. On the other hand, uh, if we do have any Italian listeners, I don't know if we do. Probably not. Well, not now. They they might... Yeah, (laughs) definitely not now. (laughs) We had some about 10 or 15 minutes ago. Yes. Um... Yeah. Yeah. So. And, any uh, any closing thoughts? <laughs> no, except again, I kind of I I felt it it ultimately didn't succeed that well. I mean, it, it I don't know what the special characteristic of Andreotti is supposed to be. Maybe I'm supposed to kind of know already what it is, or the Italian audience takes it for granted. But it didn't really end up communicating terribly much to me about his psychology mm. or his use of power or anything. I enjoyed getting lost in it. Uh, One of the scandals that he was involved in was called Tangentopoly. And I think Tangentopolis would be a pretty good name for this film because it does feel like a a whole urban sprawl of different tangents. But I dig that, and I think if you dig that, you'll dig this. Uh, Okay, yes, fair enough. Oh, well, nice to... We actually have a difference of opinion for once. Uh, Yeah, that's very true. I say, to tell you the truth... I say give it a miss, but mm. if you like the sound of it, yeah, it does definitely have its moments. And like you say, Sorrentino does have quite kind of stylish bits, which are put to good use, yeah, in mm. some cases. Uh, right, so we'll go for a break there, I think. But on the other side, listeners, uh, we have a whole slew of off the shelf features. We've got marketing the Timothy Dalton years of James Bond, we've got Aiden covering Hirokatsu Koryeda's first film made outside Japan, and we've got Mick reviewing villain starring Richard Burton. Perplexed by the pompous, ponderous piffle pervaded by normal art critics. Well, you've come to the right place, because we're not normal. We take a not-so-serious look at the serious worlds of art and literature. Join Sarah, Andrew, Rob and Graham for a piffle-free journey through the cultural landscape of the 21st century. Literary loitering. Because you can't make a cultural omelette without smashing a few eggheads. My name's Quentin Flynn, I'm here on The Geek Show. Uh, Why? Because I play Raiden in the Metal Gear series. I am lightning, the rain transformed, and I have been transformed by hanging out on this show. So tune in and turn on, you'll love it. The Geek Show, it rocks.
So if you're enjoying what you're listening to, uh, you can donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show. We're always grateful for anything you can give, particularly nowadays. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter by searching for TGS underscore The Geek Show or follow us on Facebook by looking for The Geek Show. Uh, remember to click subscribe and give us a review so you can keep up to date with whatever we're doing next. It's an impossible mission to talk about video games without upsetting someone, so join us at The Geek Show as we lean right into that. On Impossible Mission, we take two YouTube episodes and mush them into one seamless hole, on which we talk about happenings from the world of video games or something we just find cool. Formerly known as Press X, and born in you as Impossible Mission, join us as part of The Geek Show Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can't handle the truth! So I've just seen the new film by Hirokazu Koreeda, The Truth, which is his first um, international co-production. Um, so his first film shot outside his native Japan. And um, one thing that I went into noticing about this is how much you would like to divorce Hirokazu Koreeda from his usual um, flair, shall we just say. So normally, if you're familiar with him, you know that he makes family dramas within Japanese society, but it also, you know, provokes like grander themes about unity, sometimes about um the corruption underneath um society around Japanese politics so think about the thievery like the family gets to and ups to and shoplifts is or like Hiroshi Abe's gambling addiction and the decadence that causes in after the storm but I think the truth is a very different beast from all those things truth be told I mean it stars um three iconic actors two from France and one from America um, the first two is Catherine Deneuve, who plays Fabienne, the grandmother of this family um, unit, we, who's like an ageing film actress uh, who's gone way outside her prime and wants to, you know, gain new heights, um, new prominence, shall I say, in a autobiography that she signed off and a um, film she's about to star in a sci-fi film. Um, then we have Lumaire, uh, you know, the daughter of Fabian's character, played by Julia Benoche, who is much, you know, much more grieved, I should say, about, um, you know, the inaccuracies that her uh, Fabian's autobiography is displaying to the public. Um, so she often dresses completely differently from, like, the, like, stiff lioness neck-like that Fabian has and, you know, tries to be more full of um, contempt, maybe, a bit more bitterness towards her than, you know, the eye would awfully see. We have Hank, who is Lumaire's um, husband, who's played by Ethan Hawke. Um, again, taking more of a page out from his character from boyhood, really, being this very lar- larger-than-life father figure to their daughter, Charlotte, and obviously the co-internationality of her. Um, additionally, you know, he often plays like a really big child in an adult's body, so he plays with the children all the time. But it also ha- hides the darkness inside his character that he is like recently just got out of rehab. And of course that, you know, impacts the development of their child. Now, I think... The Truth is a film that I liked rather than I loved. I mean, if you know me, or indeed myself, or one of my co-hosts, Robs, you know we are a massive banger of the drum for Hirokazu Koryu's work because he can just capture magic inside the normality of life. And, you know, with something like this, there's certainly scenes where he does, like, regain, like, you know, try- captures magic that you would find in, like... Um, this time, obviously, not in, uh, you know, his native Japan. This time, it's obviously France. And it certainly does. And, you know, I'm slightly relieved at that fact because I think it is a very, very, you know, you know, very starkly funny film when it wants to be, but can also, like, underpin the truth that it needs to. I mean, there's a scene between Juliette Benoche and uh, Catherine Deneuve, which, I mean, the scene in question, you know, even both of them really do hold against each other. There's a scene where um, Fabienne describes her working, about to work on Alfred Hitchcock's next project before he ultimately passed away, only for Lumiere Lumiere to um, immediately say to her, well, I wonder how that would play out, and then reenacts this famous stabbing sequence from Psycho, which is a very starkly funny reminder of how, you know, 
Corrida can obviously meld this world together to make it feel like much more alive. Um, and that really um, provides a, a really great taste with me. I, I really like it when directors do that. But I think my problem with um, The Truth, I don't know whether something is gotten lost in translation, but I, I do think that something isn't quite gelling well with me in The Truth than it is in Corrida's other films, really. And I don't know whether that's just due to the writing or the pacing, but something, it, it, it doesn't entice me to a rewatch specifically. Um, despite all the lovely things that I, I really like, do like about this film, I do think it has a couple problems here and there. Like, for example, I, I do think Ethan Hawke's character in general, even though he's playing it well, I do think his character is a bit too similar to his character found in Boyhood. And I, I do think... Um, you know, nothing wrong with that. I'm not expecting like an Ernst Toller character from at first reformed in a Corrida film, for goodness sake. But I am expecting a little bit of more substance to his character. And I, I just think he just didn't quite work for me. Juliette Binoche does fare a little bit better, um, though I, I do like her commitments to actor, acting. And to be honest, it's Juliette Binoche. So I accept her any way, shape or form. I don't think she's really done that many bad performances, really. Um... But I think the true star of the show is Catherine Deneuve, and Catherine Deneuve is really, really terrific in this, I think. Um, no matter if she's playing this very icy, horrible woman towards her daughter, I mean, there's various sequences in the film like displaying this, like the smaller arguments, essentially, between mother and daughter. But I think what really glues well in this is the film within a film sequences. There's a scene that particularly highlights this where Catherine Deneuve... Um, does a film within a film sequence and um, she impromptuously collapses to the floor, obviously indicating, you know, her character's health, really. Um, and of course, all the PAs to the director try to rush in and help her, but um, the director halts them and, you know, tries to capture this magic entirely. But the director also has a problem when the take finishes, saying that it's a little bit too slowly. Can you speed up the process a little bit of this method, at least by 20%, he says, precisely. Only for... Catherine Deneuve to ultimately say what is this an advertisement don't you see that you know I'm trying to make essentially a much more grander performance and it's a great moment and I, I do think the truth reveals that factor of a character that underneath like the acting and all this you know gloss and makeup you see something trying to break through really and I, I really do appreciate that so overall there's not a lot much more I can say about that I, I think the truth is pleasant it's um very very well made I mean you know, going into a Corrida film and not expecting that is, like, obviously you are committing, like, a true act of uh, treason. <laughs> um, and overall, um, you know, it's, it's enjoyable. I mean, if you're a fan of Corrida's work, I mean, definitely, definitely do check it out if needs be. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it as a starting point, personally speaking. If you want a good starting point with him, obviously I recommend Shoplifters, After the Storm, Still Walking, which is my personal favourite of his movies. Um... If you want to get like a truer sense of, um, you know, the underlying themes of the family unit, like I was explaining before, like the gambling addiction in um, After the Storm or of Deve the Thievery or the decadence found in Shoplifters. Um, here, it, it's a bit more obviously abstract because you're dealing with um, thoughts of like method acting, um, philosophy, etc., and it's, don't get me wrong, it's not like a terrible idea, but it, it's just much more harder to grasp, I think. And that, I think, can be a detractor in the truth's eyes. It's a lesser film for sure. But to be honest, I mean, when Corrida does a lesser film, he does it right. And to be honest, I respect him an awful lot for at least trying something different, trying something completely out of the box. I mean, it's, it's a hard ask for him to obviously ask for lightning to strike twice, especially in the light of shoplifters. But that's the truth. That's out now on Curzon Home Cinema. Um, I don't know what the release schedule is obviously in the US. I don't know what platforms it's on. Um, but you can try it um, whenever you like. And that is out available now. You can't handle the truth! In the now extended run up to No Time to Die, we're looking back at every actor who has ever played the part of James Bond. And this week, we're covering a pair of films that always deserve another look. 
Picking up with the next entry after the Roger Moore era, the year is 1987. Margaret Thatcher is re-elected for a third term as Prime Minister. IKEA launches in the UK and 20 years before Daniel Craig did it, Timothy Dalton is Ian Fleming's James Bond 007. Who are you? Bond. James Bond. While I've previously been guilty of overstating this at the expense of the films in question, the brief but exceptional Timothy Dalton era blazes a trail down which the Bond movies would not embark again until Casino Royale in 2006. Furthermore, as I've cheerfully acknowledged in previous episodes, uh, Dalton twice turned down the role when it was up for grabs, uh, first for On Her Majesty's Secret Service and then for Octopussy. Dalton almost turned it down for a third time due to scheduling conflicts, but when that was cleared up he gave producer Albert Broccoli some pretty definitive terms before he agreed to take on the role. In a 1989 interview, Dalton remarked that he hadn't wanted to take over from Roger Moore when initially offered, because he felt that the films had lost track of their sense of story at that point, lining up villain after villain who either wanted to rule or destroy the world. The problem, as he saw its quote, was, you, if you want to believe in the fantasy on screen, you have to believe in the characters and use them as a stepping stone to lead you into this fantasy world. Uh, Broccoli agreed with this outlook at this point in the franchise's history and Dalton signed on the dotted line to appear in three films as Bond uh, and in the first of those films, The Living Daylights, we immediately see his influence brought to bear. Go ahead, tell him what you want. He fires me, I'll thank him for it. Whoever she was must have scared the living daylights out of her. Far from uh, Christopher Walken's Silicon Valley lunacy in the previous film, this one concerns a dormant Soviet intelligence program called Smeat Spionum, translation Death to Spies, and arms dealing villains who seek to make Bond a pawn in their scheme to assassinate a Russian general played by the mighty John Rhys Davies. That's the simplest way of putting what turns out to be a pretty densely detailed and ultimately quite satisfying spy thriller. In the centre of it all, Bond has never been more lupine than he is when Dalton plays him. He's got this unparalleled knack for cold, glowering fury and wrath, but he's not above enjoying himself in the role either. In another trope-busting aspect of his performance, this Bond cuts a rather more monogamous figure than most. It's not like he's getting wed anytime soon, but the sexual politics of his rather chaste courtship of Mariam Darbo's cello player drags the series into the 1980s about seven years late. Granted, the mystery element leaves the film's multiple villains feeling somewhat ill-defined compared to those previous escapades, but from the mission statement of the wild pre-title sequence to the, f uh, the airborne action finale, this feels like the franchise reasserting its identity after the inconsistencies of the Moore era. It's wilder still that the second Dalton film remains the series' biggest ever departure from formula. Make a sound, and you're dead. No! Ah! Your license to kill is revoked. Effective immediately. In my business, you prepare for the unexpected. License to Kill is a violent revenge movie that doubles down on this Bond's tendency to take things personally. More than making up for the scattershot villainy of the living daylights, this film dispenses with Her Majesty's Secret Service almost entirely after Bond's CIA busy and endlessly recast side character Felix Leiter is attacked on his wedding day. What sets it apart from the Schwarzenegger and Stallone actioners of the era that some negative reviews compared it to is the Yojimbo-inspired story that follows, with Bond embedding himself off his own bat in the organisation of drug kingpin Franz Sanchez, who is magnificently played by Robert Darby, and then systematically demolishing that organisation one loose connection at a time. The man who constantly introduces himself as Bond James Bond does his best secret agent work after he leaves MI6. And while Daniel Craig's Bond has either quit or gone rogue in every single one of his adventures to date, this was only the second or third time the character had gone off preservation in such a way. Uh, the result might not be the best Bond film, but it is one of the very best action films of the bunch, starting with an airplane stunt that Christopher Nolan would directly homage at the start of The Dark Knight Rises, and ending with an articulated truck chase that's all the more impressive for being taken seriously, and not underscored with silly music cues. Elsewhere, Kerry Lowell's Pam Bouvier is one of the great unsung leading ladies of the franchise, and a baby-faced Benicio Del Toro turns up to act up a storm, as the one henchman who can identify Bond, bringing the sort of suspense that only comes from Benicio Del Toro looking at you like he thinks he knows there are no two ways about it really, License to Kill is an all time banger that combines the emotional edge of Dalton's performance with a viscerally satisfying revenge movie plot. And despite License to Kill unwisely being fired headfirst under the treads of summer 1989 juggernaut Batman and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the plan was for Dalton to fulfil his contract, with one of the proposed outlines for his third film eventually evolving into 1995's GoldenEye. The original draft for this film reads like a combination of the best parts of both The Living Daylights and License to Kill, and was originally designed to star Anthony Hopkins in the role that Sean Bean eventually took. 
of all the Bond films never made. I'm personally excited that we didn't get to see this one. Timothy Dalton should get an Oscar and beat Sean Connery over the head with it! We'll come around to Pierce Brosnan's more nostalgia-driven take in next week's episode, but Dalton, more successfully than anyone until the 21st century soft reboot, sells his Bond as a man, or rather, as a real person. To quote the star himself once again, it's very important to make the man believable so you can stretch the fantasy. He also added, whether people like this kind of Bond is another question. And to paraphrase another 1980s movie, I guess Bond fans weren't ready for that yet, but their kids would love it. If nothing else, Timothy Dalton is a serious Bond, and next week we'll explore the Pierce Brosnan era, whether the slings and arrows are pop culture and parodies. You can't handle the truth! Right, you stag. <laughs> listen up, and listen up good, right? Because okay. I'm going to tell you about a, a film, right, from 1971. All right? All right. And if you talk, if uh, you grass, all right, all right yeah. I will make you grin mm. in a way that you won't be able to stop. You get me? I get you. Right. All right. It's not, it's not the worst accent. We're being <laughs> criticised for our accents here. I mean, that's impressive because I, I was mostly just doing erotic growling. <laughs> yeah, but it's... So, right, you need to hear the accents in this film before you criticise ours, and you <laughs> need to look up the word erotic. <laughs> so... <laughs> Possibly also growling. Right, um... <laughs> We've so, done it. We broke Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so this film is Villain, which is out from Vintage Classics uh, at Studio Canal. Um, and Studio Canal also maybe need a dictionary in order to look up the word classics. <laughs> I'll give them vintage. <laughs> uh, but just as, just as a note, just because it's got Richard Burton in doesn't necessarily make it a classic. Good Lord, is that ever true? Especially when it comes from, shall we call it the post-Taylor era? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's. When pretty much the only criteria for Richard Burton accepting a, a script was that it had words in it. Yeah, obviously. Is there a <laughs> mini bar near the filming location? Yeah. So this um, this is Villain from 1971, and it it is based on a novel. Uh, Richard Burton plays Vic Dakin, the um, gay, uh, lovely to his mother, gang lord, who may or may not be based on a Cray twin. Yes. It's subtle in its inspirations. It is, yeah. Um, it's based on the 1968 novel Burden of Proof, uh, and it's written by Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet, who, of course, were big in the gangland media releases of the 70s. Would you like to back that statement up? They wrote a lot of it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I mostly associate them with sitcoms. They did, but they also did a lot of stuff with Houston Films, and, oh, right. uh, and they, they worked on things like uh, The Avengers and uh, The Sweeney and okay. stuff like that. I mean, they were jobbing script writers yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, now... The thing about this is it's either a really poor feature film. Right. Or it's a really good episode of The Sweeney <laughs> that could afford Richard Burton. With a couple of minor cast, it's, it's, it's a bit like a pilot for The Sweeney. Yeah. So instead of uh, the uh, classic Sweeney pairing of Waterman and Thor, you've got Nigel Davenport and Colin Welland as the coppers. Neither of whom could write the theme tune or sing the theme tune. Indeed, indeed. So um, you've got that. You've got a very young Ian McShane as uh, (laughs) the excellently named, and I I need to look this up because his his surname isn't mentioned very often, (laughs) but um, Wolf Listener. Wolf Listener. Wow. He listens to wolves. It's like the antithesis of the horse whisperer. <laughs> uh, but Wolf Listener is one of Vic's former employees, part of the firm, mm. and the the gay element of Vic's character isn't overplayed. 
he's not a particularly flamboyant man. Mm. Um, and there's only a couple of hints that maybe in addition to being in addition to being one of his hoods, um, Wolf Listener is also a little bit of a rent boy for him. Right. Um and it's only hinted at really. It's not Yeah, I mean seventy one. Yeah, seventy one it's uh it would have been a career suicide had yeah. Richard Burton not already com- committed that by drinking himself under the table. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so it's directed by Michael Tuckner, Um And what he's done is using the rest of the 300 and something thousand pound budget hmm. uh, that wasn't spent on Richard Burton's bar bill. He's brought in <laughs> what is quite literally a who's who of the next 10 years of ITV and BBC crime drama <laughs> villainy. Right. You've got John Hallam. You've got Joss Ackland. You, <laughs> you've you wow. got T.P. McKenna, which also coincidentally is a short list of guest stars from 1980s Who. Yes, it um, is. Tony Selby's in there. Wow. It's, it, and, th- and this is it. I, I think this is the, the crying shame about it because... If it was an episode of the Sweeney, it would be a good, solid episode of the Sweeney. Although people might complain that it wasn't as violent as usual episodes. <laughs> um, at the end of the film, when everything closes in and the the cops finally sort of move in to bring Dakin down, yeah, there's even a freeze frame that goes into that sort of blue half tone right <laughs> image, nice. frozen image of uh, Burton. Uh, so it's got that feel of being a Sweeney type um, yeah. episode, as as a TV or sort of TV movie mm. level uh, crime action thriller. It works, yeah. As a movie, not so much. Right. As a vintage classic, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's never going to be. It's never going to be a film that perhaps gets marketed as the British Godfather. <laughs> right. But it is worth watching for Donald Sinden's crooked MP. Okay. That's Donald Sinden playing a crooked MP, not Donald Sinden's local MP appearing in the film. <laughs> I should point that out. Yeah, we're making no allegations no. about Donald Sinden's local MP. Yeah, it, it, it sort of mixes up things like the Italian job, the Sweeney, there was a movie version of the Sweeney. There was, yes. I don't mean the one with Plan B in. No. I mean... It was the one that... Was it just called Sweeney with an exclamation mark of, um, is that my fantasy of what a Sweeney movie should be called? That was the Darren Aronofsky remake, wasn't it? Sweeney! (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, you know, if you're a Burton completist, it's one that you... You may see, but I'd leave it to the end of the list if you don't want to uh, sort of put yourself off. You can't have it right at the end of the list. He did much worse chod than this. He was in Exorcist 2, The Heretic. Have you seen this? I haven't. Right. <laughs> I did, the only thing I know about Villain is that it's the Richard Burton movie that they had a poster up of in the video for You Stole the Sun From My Heart by the Manic Street Preachers. Well, there you go. It has at least got that it's as a cinematic legacy. Completely. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're going to look at sort of crime-led 70s films, I'd look towards your McVickers and things like that. It would not, not villain. Yeah. Uh, but it is out on the 30th of March from Studio Canal Vintage Classics, in inverted commas. You can't handle the truth! Well, normally we end the show by saying what's out next week, but in this case, there's absolutely no point doing that at all. Because nothing's out next week, and indeed, it's possible Ever. one of us will be alive, or certainly not be <laughs> yes. part of any functioning civilization. So, yeah. So you know, if you find yourself in a Mad Max style apocalyptic wasteland, but you are still thinking, hmm. I wonder if there's a new podcast out I can listen to. Uh, We've got a bit of good news for you, because next week's Cinema Eclectica is our 250th episode. 250? Too many, in my opinion, but yep, that's what it is. 
If only there was some way we could unmake them, but there isn't. <laughs> yes. If we, we think there's too many, we could just cancel this one and start an entirely new podcast under a different name. No, yes, it's not that the, great an idea. The Witness Protection Program approach to podcasting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for our 250th show, we always like to do something a bit special for the anniversaries. And we thought, since we've been going since 2015, which is, you know, a while, uh, we would do a feature of films of our lifetime that we've missed, which is, say, any film that's come out in the UK since we started podcasting, but that one or more of us didn't get the chance to see. I will be doing Booksmart, which I know Sarah picked as her film of the year last year, but I never got around to watching. Rob will do Hard to Be a God, and hopefully by the end of the 12-week quarantine period, he will have had time to watch it. And <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the sort of thing we're doing, along with Mark's latest Bond retrospective. So, until next week. Can we not do an entirely sort of contagion and pandemic themed episode would that not be the thing to do say uh steven soderbergh's contagion or um like you say the mad max films about society having collapsed we could call that the tastelessly themed episode you know the <laughs> episode. it feels like a hostage to fortune i mean I, i've made quite a lot of coronavirus jokes on this show but uh listeners in in all seriousness uh do stay safe and we hope you and yours get through this all right um yeah but until next week with the 250th episode special uh that's been a lot from cinema Classica. i've been graham and i've been tim see you next week <laughs>